A little over two months ago, I was contacted by a company called Bamboo Lab to let me know that they were getting closer to releasing a new 3D printer called the X1 Carbon that they were interested in me testing. In that email, they listed some of the specs, like complete automated calibration using LiDAR technology, acceleration set to 10,000, a fully enclosed Core XY machine with hardened steel nozzle and extruder gears capable of printing with high temp abrasive materials, and an optional multi-material upgrade to name a few. This all sounded great, but it was launching on Kickstarter. Generally, I do not test out Kickstarter machines or accessories and 99% of the inquiries I get, get turned down. And the primary reasons for this is that a lot of times it's a large established company that's wanting to just use it as sort of a marketing platform or it's just another Ender style clone and I don't feel like it's really contributing anything or has anything new and exciting. This was neither of those things. And although I was incredibly skeptical about the features that were listed out in the previous email, they were more than accommodating to answer all of my initial questions and I agreed to see what the X1 Carbon was all about. Well, I've had the X1 Carbon for a couple of weeks now and it has quickly blown me away. In this video, we are going to be diving into the X1 Carbon from Bamboo Lab. It is going to be one of the longer videos I think I've ever done on this channel, so I will be sure to have chapters down below so you can jump around if there's a specific topic that you're really interested in seeing. This Wednesday, the 25th at noon Pacific Standard Time, I'm going to be having a live stream on the Modbot Army channel with this printer and the material station where we will be Taking a look at it, I'll answer any questions that I can to the best of my ability and be doing some printing. So if you watch this video and you are interested or have additional questions, be sure to hop over there. I'll have a link in the description over to that live stream. So with all that being said and without further ado, let's get right into today's video. Starting off, let's jump right into the specs because there is an absolute ton to cover. As mentioned a moment ago, the X1 Carbon is a Core XY system with a build volume of 256 by 256 by 256 millimeters. The frame of the machine is made out of steel panels that have been welded together and the rest of the machine is made up of injection molded plastic with aluminum and glass panels. The X1 Carbon is completely enclosed and it has a glass door in the front as well as a glass top so that you can easily access the machine if you need to. The extrusion system is direct drive and made up of hardened steel as well as the nozzle and it has a very short filament path. The hot end is all metal and can print up to 300 Celsius. As for cooling, there is a small fan that cools the heatsink and a fairly large blower fan for layer cooling with ducts on both sides of the nozzle. The front cover of the x carriage assembly is held in place by magnets, so it's super easy to remove and access both the extruder as well as the hot end if needed. In addition to the layer cooling fan, there is a massive fan mounted on the inside of the machine that blows air upwards through a duct that then goes across the entire build plate and is super effective for cooling. This is something I've never seen before on a stock machine. The only place I've seen anything even remotely similar are on very heavily modified machines for things like the Benchy Speedboat Race. The X1 Carbon uses carbon fiber rods for the X axis to help keeping weight down and it uses smooth rods for the Y axis with LMA UU style bearings. The right side of the carriage has an attached LiDAR scanner which allows the printer to do some pretty insane testing and calibrating that I have never seen before. We'll touch more on that a little bit later in this video. For the bed, the printer comes with a magnetic flex plate system that has two sides. One side is a removable sheet for PLA, ABS, and PTG called the cool plate, and the other side uses some sort of a coating that I've also not seen before on spring steel, and it's the engineer plate used for nylon, polycarbonate, and TPU filament. The bed rides up and down on three lead screws that are all tied together using a belt system on the bottom side of the machine, and it makes it incredibly rigid. Additionally, there is a carbon filter in the back of the machine, an LED light bar to light up the bed, and a camera for monitoring your prints. Wiring is very neat, and the X carriage uses a singular USB-C cable that is routed through a cable chain. There's also a purge shoot system on the back of the machine that is very, very cool for purging material out of the nozzle or prepping it before a print next to the nozzle cleaning system, which we'll touch on also a little bit later in this video. The X1 Carbon does not have an actively heated chamber, but it does have a chamber thermistor, so you can keep tabs on how hot it is inside while you are printing. It also has the ability to exhaust air from inside of the machine, depending on the material you're printing with. If it gets too warm, it can help to pull some of that warm air out. Interfacing with the machine is done through the five and a half inch touchscreen mounted to the very front that has a swivel and it is very, very crisp. You have the option to print locally via micro SD card or from the slicer or their app via the bamboo cloud. Internally, there is a 32 bit motion controller and a separate quad core ARM A7 
for the AI and application processing. The firmware running on the X1 Carbon is internally developed by Bamboo Lab. The printer came packaged very well and the AMS station was inside of the machine held in place by a couple of screws that you had to remove, which really helped prevent it from getting damaged during shipment. Also, the bed for the machine was actually bolted to the base of the printer, so I had to remove three screws from the bed before I was able to power on the machine, which again, the goal of that is to help maintain the levelness of the bed as well as to prevent damage during the shipping process. The setup process was very simple. I powered on the machine and it asked me for my Wi-Fi information. After connecting to the Wi-Fi, it ran through a series of initial setup and calibration tests. During the calibration process, I was already getting very excited. Once the tool head zips to its corner, it comes out and the bed homes itself. It does sort of a bouncing motion quite a few times and each time it is reading its distance away from the nozzle. So that way it is incredibly consistent as far as its gap away from the nozzle every time you home this printer. Once the bed homed, it ran resonance compensation for anybody that is used to using clipper. That is input shaper where the tool head goes to the middle, basically is sent a series of different vibrations all different frequencies and with that data, the machine is able to then compensate or sort of counter those vibrations, which the sole purpose of that is so that when you are printing quickly, it helps to eliminate a lot of the ringing or kind of ghosting that you would normally see when printing very quickly. After that, it ran a five by five grid mesh bed leveling using a combination of sensors in the bed as well as the LiDAR attached to the tool head. It uses the data from both of those to basically check for redundancy and the the calibration process, again, definitely got me pumped up. I've certainly used input shaper before on quite a few of my machines, especially the Vorons that I've been building lately, but to see a machine that came with that from the factory is certainly not something that I've ever seen or experienced before. Once the calibration was complete, I was ready to do some printing, so I loaded in some PLA and I found a pre-slice Benchy file on the internal memory of this machine. During the print startup, I got to see the LiDAR again in action. The printer lays down a grid on the edge of the bed that is scanned as well as a few long lines that it also then scans. I asked for clarity on this and was told that it is calibrating flow at different speeds, essentially a pressure advance or linear advance test for that specific material, as well as confirming the nozzle's height. Once the first layer laid down, the LiDAR scanner then did another pass where it's analyzing that first layer. Based off the information it gets, it's either going to do nothing and just continue printing or it will pop up on the screen letting you know that the first layer doesn't look as ideal as it could or should and it'll give you the option to either continue or kill the print. If you don't do anything at, at this point, it will go ahead and just continue printing, but it is sort of kind, kind of a cool way to verify that the first level is looking good because if it doesn't see any issues, then most certainly you have a really solid first layer. Once the Benchy started printing, I freaked out. I don't know how I missed it in my excitement of sort of getting this thing set up and didn't see that it said that it was a 17 minute Benchy, which is by far the fastest Benchy I've ever printed by a mile. At the time that I was setting this up and running that first print, Erin was running some errands and the second she pulled in, I ran out the front door like an idiot with a big smile on my face to show her a clip of the Benchy printing because I was just so excited and a little bit scared because again, I just have not seen a Benchy ever print that quick before. The Benchy does still have some slight room for improvements, but considering I've printed Benchies that have taken four times as long that still haven't looked this good, I would call it a really, really solid first print. It was around the time that I pulled that first print off the bed where I started to realize that this was not like any other machine I had ever tested. All I had done was take the machine out of the box, turn it on, it did all of its calibrating, and I just hit print. I didn't have to do anything, adjust anything, really check anything at all. The printer just did all the work for me. The first day I received the machine, I did not have access to the bamboo slicer, so I went ahead and just printed a wide variety of pre-sliced files that came on the printer itself that were all in PLA. I don't know the exact settings that they were all sliced at, but the speeds were all equally insane, and what I can do is, is show you the extent of time it took to print them, because it does state how long each print took, so that way you have that as some form of a reference. After all the PLA test prints I threw at it, I had no question in my mind that this thing could print PLA at a very, very high speed. So the next day when I got access to the slicer, I was ready to throw some different materials at it to see how it performed. All the materials were sliced with the same profile and 0.2 layer height with the only difference being things like the temperature and retraction. The speeds listed on the screen are the speeds I used for everything I sliced on my own, including TPU, which is just insane. I ran ABS, PETG, carbon fiber nylon, and TPU. 
They recommend putting a light coat of glue stick on the bed when using it, which I did do, and I had really good adhesion across the board. Again, I'm not entirely sure what either of the two build surfaces are because they seem slightly different to everything that I've used, but it, whatever, whatever it is, it does stick to your parts very well. The TPU prints are some of the nicest TPU prints I've ever done, and each phone case took just over an hour roughly, which is substantially faster than I could have ever printed them on any other machine I've tested out TPU on. The carbon fiber nylon was also incredibly easy to print, and I almost forgot I was printing with carbon fiber nylon because I just loaded it up, used the presets, hit print, and was really, really pleased with the end result. Not only, again, the extrusion, but the adhesion. Nylon is known to be tricky, and the engineering sheet with a tiny bit of glue stick on it just did such a great job of biting into that part while it was printing. The majority of the issues I've had during printing were not caused by the machine, but actually the filament themselves. When I was printing with the translucent PETG, I had what I thought was a clog, which really bummed me out, but after unloading the PETG spool, I saw that there was actually inconsistencies in the PETG's extrusion. All I did was cut off that wider area on the spool, hit reprint, and the print turned out perfect. Another issue that I had was on a spool of PLA that was on a coil. I guess when I uncoiled it, I sort of got the filament crossed at one point. And so the machine quite literally could not pull the filament anymore, which is what caused a failure on that particular print. With the carbon fiber nylon, the first print that I printed out, although the adhesion was great, the the actual extrusion quality looked really bad. And looking at it, it seemed quite obvious to me that the nylon, the carbon fiber nylon was just wet. So I reprinted the exact same print, which looked a little bit better, but also still had uh, quite a bit of inconsistencies. I threw the carbon fiber into a dryer overnight and reprinted it with the exact same settings and the difference was night and day. So again, it was moisture, it was inconsistencies in the extrusion and it was a tangled spool. None of those were the fault of the machine or its ability to print out parts. The only real issue I noticed on some of the prints was that on the top layer, on certain materials or certain geometries, the top solid infill did not seem to fully touch the perimeter. There was like a slight bit of missing extrusion or under extrusion. I did let the team know and they said that was something that they were working on sort of in their flow algorithm that they're constantly optimizing, but it was definitely not on all prints and it was mostly on ones where I was just going buck crazy with the speed and they were fairly complex parts. For slicer options and as far as file type goes, technically I was told that you can use standard G-code, like something that you would get in Super Slicer or Prusa Slicer or even Cura. However, the Bamboo Studio Slicer is the one that's recommended. The way it was explained to me is that their file type is sort of like G-code that's wrapped in with some additional data. Specifically, this machine again has the LiDAR capabilities, which is not something that standard G-code, uh, I believe has any form of ability to interact with. And the, for example, the screen on here, it has some additional data. Like if you plug a file in, you can click on that file and see what material specifically it was sliced for, which is really handy because if you're printing PLA, ABS, and PTG, and you want to reprint something and you don't remember what you sliced it for, it can easily tell you, hey, this was sliced for PTG, so you can avoid any sort of errors in that regard. Due to that, the Bamboo Studio Slicer is one that is developed in-house. I did initially have some concerns because I've used quite a few other slicers that were sort of like proprietary or for a specific machine over the years, and they are usually very bare bones, but I was pleasantly surprised to see that the slicer in its current state is quite snappy, quite intuitive, and has a lot of features. I had no stability issues or crashing. The main things that I think need to be sort of Updated still is some of the user interface, the graphics in some of the areas are just not very great. And then there's also still some room for, of course, additional features. One of the things that I mentioned was the ability to control flow if I wanted to on certain areas. For example, if I want the top layer to have a slightly higher flow, I would like that. While right now in the slicer, you basically have a general flow scale. So if you adjust the flow for that material, it's going to adjust the flow across the entire print. With the slicer, you have the ability to print over the bamboo cloud, or if you prefer, you can export directly to the micro SD card, plug it into the printer and print completely locally. There's also an app, but it is at this point pretty heavily in beta. I used it with test flight on my iPhone and it does let you monitor your printer, get notifications as well as update the machine's firmware and even reprint the files you recently printed. But the menu system overall needs some work and a few of the pages just have some sort of generic placeholders. Hardware-wise, I would say that this printer is as complete as any other printer I've tested before. 
The hardware seems rock solid and you can tell that a ton of thought has gone into it. I don't have any or didn't experience any issues that were hardware related. I was told before receiving this machine that this machine is the first off their line of what the production units are going to be like. The areas that can use some additional development are the slicer, the app, the firmware, and the bamboo cloud. The slicer, like I said, is pretty damn impressive and it has the majority of the features that I want. And it needs a slight little bit of a UI update or development on the UI as well as some small features. But in my opinion, it's like 90% complete. For the firmware, it's also pretty solid and the main core functionalities all work well. Some of the things related to the AMS, I think still need to be updated. And I did notice on one or two occasions, one of the words had a slight typo, which I was told was due to the translation. And that is something that they're going to be fixing. I do think that the firmware, at least with regards to the LCD screen, can use a little bit of optimization. I noticed when browsing through the gallery, there is a slight bit of delay, but nothing that makes the machine unusable. Just something I feel can be optimized. And I was also told that the camera on this machine is going to allow you to use like spaghetti detective style AI. That is not something that is available right now, so I cannot speak on behalf of that. So that is something that is supposed to be coming in the future. The app is apparently much more developed on Android, but on iOS, like I said, it definitely still needs quite a bit more work. In the time I've been testing this out over the last couple of weeks, there has been four updates for iOS through their test flight. So they are clearly actively working on it. But again, I still would say it's definitely not near complete at this point. The biggest and most important thing to me is the expanding of their cloud servers. Depending on the time of day, it took me in some instances up to five minutes to slice a file, transfer it to the cloud and have the cloud send it back down to the printer. Also, they do have camera functionality that you can stream on the slicer to see your printer as well as on the app. And it seems it's also cloud related, but I had some bugginess with that. When it did stream, it streamed very nicely. It was incredibly consistent and the quality of the camera seems pretty high resolution, but I did have quite a few times where I wasn't able to access the camera on my printer. After using this printer for a couple days, I put together a ridiculous list of questions and Bamboo Lab was awesome enough to hop on a call with me for two hours and answer every single question that I had. Bamboo Lab is based out of China, but they have an office in Texas, which is what they are building out. And that is where they're going to be offering their US support as well as US repairs and US spare parts. They let me know that as of right now, the servers are overseas because that's where most of the testing was previously done. And that is also why it is a bit slow. They said that they are currently in talks with quite a few other cloud computing or cloud server expansion providers. And so by the time the printer is launched here fully for everyone in the United States off Kickstarter that they should have servers that are much more local, which will help to resolve any of the delays when it comes to the camera streaming or the uploading and printing via the cloud. They did assure me a couple of times that the scalability and the reliability of their cloud server is one of their absolute top priorities. A couple of minute transfer to me hasn't been that big of a deal. And I will say that if for some reason there is an issue with the cloud, you can at least save to the micro SD card and print locally, completely avoiding that altogether. For those interested in multicolor or multi-material printing, I did want to touch on the AMS, but honestly, that thing could use a video of its own and I would still like to do a lot more printing with that. However, I will do my best to cover what my experience has been like so far using the AMS multi-material multi-filament station. So starting off, what is the AMS? The AMS is a four spool holding unit that can be added onto your printer that you place on top of the machine or on the side. It connects to the printer with two cables that allow the two to communicate with each other. The filament is grabbed at the AMS and fed through a Bowden tube to a buffer system and then into your printer's extruder slash hot end. The buffer system makes sure that the AMS is pushing the correct amount of filament that the extruder needs to pull while printing. It allows you to front load filament instead of having to go around the back it is airtight and it has two fairly large desiccant slots to help with maintaining low humidity. Currently, if you're printing with just a single spool, it grabs the leftmost spool to print with, but I was told that in an update, they will make it where it's very easy from the slicer to select which spool you want to print with for what specific job. When you feed filament into any of the slots on the AMS, it feeds it through to a sensor and then backs it up to keep it ready. After each print, it unloads the spool so you never need to warm up the hot end to remove filament as they can be pulled out at any time. It has RFID, so if you do use the Bamboo Lab spool, if you drop it in there, it can tell you the color of the material, what kind of material it is, and how much filament you have left on the spool. It is by no means a requirement, and just about all of the 3D printing I've done on this thing has been with third-party filament. The only thing I will say about the AMS is that 
The compartments do not work with all spool sizes. Most of what I threw at it had no issues at all, but specifically the printed solid spools are just a tad bit too wide. And the proto pasta spools, I believe, were just a tad bit too tall. The way around having a too tall spool is just that the lid that you can completely close, if you leave it open, it doesn't put any pressure on it. And so that worked. But for the wider spools, that is something that you will need to sort of be aware of. From the slicer, you can easily add filaments for printing in multicolor and set the color, which makes it easy to get an idea of what the model will look like if printed. Between each color swap, the filament is unloaded, the new filament is loaded, it perches into the back chute and then hits a latch that opens a door to remove the purge from the machine. You'll want a bucket or trash can behind the printer to catch these unless you want a massive mess on your tabletop, which I learned very quickly. You can choose the purge length and you can also use a prime tower for additional purging if needed. I pretty exclusively use the AMS for all of my single spool or single extrusion 3D printing and multi extrusion printing and I didn't have any issues with loading or unloading. I asked about the advertisement that said you can print with up to 16 colors because when looking at it I'm there's four spools and was told there's going to be an add-on unit that basically allows you to run four of these in parallel, which just sounds insane to me. I, I have four spools is plenty for me, but if you are one that wants to get just absolutely wild, it sounds like you'll be able to sort of mess around with up to 16 <laughs> spools at some point in the future. For the AMS, I primarily use it for the convenience of front loading and being able to just sort of have four spools on top, but I did also play around a little bit with a couple multi-material prints. Prints that just require a filament swap at a certain layer are a piece of cake and look great. I tried two four color prints and the AMS did a really good job, but my slicer settings definitely need some work. I've never used really much of a purge system and color bleed is a very real thing. On the first print that I did, everything looked great except for the fact that the black filament was bleeding into the yellow filament, which is very evident in the bear's face. This is something that I can easily adjust just by going into the slicer settings and either making the prime tower bigger or just extending the purge length. But again, this is something that you don't know until you do a lot of multicolor printing, which is just something I have not done up to this point. I also printed a MakerBot dog that the color placement was perfect on, but the overhangs have quite a bit of sag on them. And the reason for that also is something that is my fault. The default profiles are set really hot because this machine's profiles are set to run very quickly. So PLA is set at 230 Celsius, which is hotter than the 220 I normally print at, which is typically something I'm told is very hot for PLA. And because it's not able to go so quickly and it's printing small areas with color, it just does not have enough time for the filament to cool. And so it gets some of that sag. So what I need to do is just take those temperatures and for multicolor printing, scale that back quite a bit. Another thing you can do is print in sequence or print by object where you have something print and then once it's done, it goes and prints something else. But the cool thing is because you can have four different spools in the AMS, it can finish a print and then swap to a different color or in some cases, probably even a different material, which really opens up the possibilities for some sort of unique combinations of printing within your build plate. The cool thing about that is that it also doesn't require any purging or waste material other than when the first print's finished and it's purging to get to the second material. Based on my time with the AMS so far, I'm really excited about its performance and I'm looking forward to doing quite a bit more experimenting and getting my settings dialed in. I, I don't see any reason why you couldn't also dual yield something like multi ABS or using PLA and some sort of breakaway or support material because unlike some other platforms where the ends of the filaments need to be heated or spliced together, it completely removes it. It sort of removes a limitation as far as as far as material compatibility goes. The X1 Carbon is unlike any other 3D printer I have tested. It's faster, smarter, and more capable than just about any other machine I've tested as well. And the crazy thing is, is that I've done absolutely zero tuning to it. It is a definite shift from the sort of standard machines that I'm used to using, considering that all or nearly all of the hardware as well as the software on this machine is proprietary, which is way different than the open source Vorans that I've been building or the Ender style machines that I've been upgrading and modding. However, I feel like there is a place for both of these in this space or in this technology. I love building and modding 3D printers, whether it's for performance or for aesthetics, and the X1 Carbon is definitely not trying to be that or fill that void. There are many people online looking at sort of these custom performance machines that want something like that, but they either don't have the time or the knowledge or really the want to do all of the sourcing and all the building and all the tuning to get the machine to that point. The ability to just buy a printer, plug it in, turn it on and print quickly and reliably is something that is very powerful. 
For print farms, Etsy shop, engineers, or really anyone that wants to print with a wide range of materials and colors, this is going to be a very attractive printer. The main goal I took away from talking to the Bamboo Lab team is that their goal is to make the barrier of entry into 3D printing much lower without sacrificing things like performance or speed or capabilities as far as materials go. And over the past couple of weeks of playing around with this, I've got to say it really seems like they have achieved that. Pricing of the Kickstarter was just released this past week, and the X1 Carbon is $849 for the early bird, and then $949 with an MSRP of $1,200. With the AMS, the early bird is $999, then $1,149 with a retail price of $1,449, which is about $1,000 less than I thought the pricing was going to be, based off of the given specs that they gave me when they initially reached out. Now, I am by no means saying you have to rush out and back the Kickstarter. If you're somebody that feels more comfortable waiting until the Kickstarter is fulfilled and then wants to get it off the shelf, I completely get that. Bamboo Lab has been incredibly accommodating and in answering all of my questions, and I feel like they have been very transparent, but as always, I want you to come to your own conclusion. My primary goal is always to just share my experience and give you one data point, but I think like with anything, you should get multiple data points and again, ultimately decide what is right for yourself. For those that are interested, I will have links down below in the description over to their website or the Kickstarter, so that way you can check out more. And again, if you do want to back it, you will have the option to do so. I really hope that Bamboo Lab continues to develop the software at sort of the rate that it seems like they're doing, and I'm really excited to seeing what other people are able to do with these machines when they get them in their hands. On that note, don't forget to like and subscribe for more great videos. We make videos every single week, so there's always fresh content coming your way. And if you do want to support the channel furthermore, I'll place links down below in the description over to our Patreon, where there are some really awesome rewards. Huge thank you to all of our existing Patreon supporters. I appreciate each and every one of you, allowing me to come back every single week and spend more time doing what I love, which is making content for you all to enjoy. On that note, this has been Daniel from ModBot, and I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Peace, guys.